Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of Social Europe Talk from the European Parliament in Brussels. My name is Henning Meyer, Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Our topic today is Germany, reality and expectations. What is Germany's role in the European Union and what are the expectations going forward? I'm glad that I'm joined today by four brilliant guests. To my right is Pavon Perez, uh, MEP Hello. from France, Hello. Javi Lopez, MEP from Spain. The third MEP is Tania Fayon from Hello. Slovenia. And last but not least, uh, Uwe Optenhügel from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation here in Brussels. So, Pervenche, uh, let me start with you. Um, from your point of view, what is Germany's role in the European Union today and how has it evolved? Wow. <laughs> I believe as a French socialist, I would uh, start by saying how much it's important that um, there's a good relationship between France and Germany. You know, it's the kind of topic uh, everybody complains when it's pushing too hard their own agenda, but when it doesn't work, everybody worries. So we have to face reality to be pragmatic. It's better when France and Germany uh, are on a strong, European-minded uh, line. I think Germany, like any other society uh, in Europe, is hit by very troubling uh, waters. I mean, um, for me it's really a, a shock that, um, or maybe not a shock, uh, but it's significant that uh, the biggest hit to democracy these days uh, did happen in countries that were the heroes of the ultra-liberalism, or the one who thought that the mondialisation rose, the uh, hopefully um, uh, globalisation, or the smooth globalisation, um, was the right way, namely UK with Brexit and the US with Trump. And I think this gives to Germany, uh, not only, but also to Germany, a very particular responsibility to make sure that what we represent as European is um, on the forefront of any agenda. And this is where, of course, the last uh, election and the last move in Germany, uh, we have to be very careful about it. Huh? Because everybody has seen that uh, the IFD had did uh, huge results or unexpected huge results in the last uh, uh, election. And that's a change, huh? let's call it like this. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I must admit that um, things are really changing in Germany. Huh? Because uh, I think, on, on some topic, and unfortunately maybe not on all topics, let me be clear. Uh, there are two topics where I can see really big changes. First, I think what uh, Chancellor Merkel did on the refugees is absolutely great. She was right to do it like this. I think maybe she did, did for internal reason for Germany because of the demographic balance and so on. But nevertheless, in the end, it matched also the uh, humanity and the value of the EU. So well done, huh? whatever the reason behind are. Uh, I can see also now that there's a debate, reopening debate about foreign policy and the role of Germany. And this is, uh, I believe, maybe sometimes for my SPD colleague more difficult. So we will have maybe to find out where we go there. And of course, for me, the, the last field I want to touch, which is still the most difficult, is when it comes to the future of the Euro. And how do you uh, overcome uh, the role of rules uh, and of the growth and stability pact, which obviously doesn't allow us to have the best uh, outcome um, of uh, any EU uh, or Eurozone economic policies. I'm so sure it's, a, it's a big uh, agenda. <laughs> huh? I'm sure we come back to the Eurozone a bit later in the show. But Tanya, uh, let me get to you. And Pervange already mentioned the uh, refugee policy that Germany uh, put in place. So against that backdrop, uh, what is your view of Germany's role in the European Union? Um, let me start first by my general impression, you know, I'm Slovenian and in my country we, we love uh, or we like Balkan mentality. We enjoy Italian food, but we admire German efficiency. And it's still the case whenever it comes to uh, that is made or that is done by Germany, we always feel that should be good. So this is a general perception. Of course, but I agree that Germany is changing a lot as well. Now with the refugee situation, because I, I was and I am still dealing a lot with it, I 
have to say I admire the German role. I also admire and I would, um, if he wouldn't have this attitude of Chancellor Merkel at that time that um, she was saying, yes, well, we can do it, whatever the reasons were, uh, whatever the arguments that she might even invite more people than we wanted to see in Europe. But in fact, it was a very human approach. It was really something that I keep, I think it kept in a way balance in Europe because we saw in many European countries a lack of solidarity. We saw a lot of nationalism, hate speech, intolerance. And Germans managed somehow to keep with her leadership a balance. And it was a very challenging situation. I, there is no single or simple answer to the refugee situation or migration crisis. But at some point I was worried if she would fail inside the German society that we would all feel consequences because we were getting into fences, borders, we were destroying Schengen area, freedom of movement. And I think here in that regard, Germany played a very important role. And not only, you have very good experience with um, integration, much better than, for example, in my country, because we are not even discussing integration. And I often went to German refugee centers or um, um, camps or see what is happening. You have this holistic approach through ministries that is something we can learn in my country how to do it. But um, on the other hand, we have very important history also. When Slovenia got after the war that started other wars in the Balkans, its independence, um, German minister Genscher was in fact the first one who recognized on the international level Slovenia. So we always feel that Germany is an engine of European Union. It's very important for my country and we always want to be very close to it. And um, following the European politics for the last 15 years, it was almost impossible to have any decision without the role of Germany. This is still the case. It used to be more strong at some periods in time. It used to be weaker. It was very important to have this Franco-German, but we were also annoyed. There were moments we were also annoyed that why always everything has to go around Germany, why we are so much influenced. Yes, it's the biggest economy, but still other countries like small countries always felt, you know, we don't have our place. We are, you know, we have to do what the big countries mm. decide upon us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tanya already made a, a few interesting remarks, yeah. uh, saying also there are very few decisions being taken without Germany, but obviously that has also its annoying moments. So, what is the view from Spain then, Javi? Well, I, I, I would want to start explaining uh, why we arrived here, no, to this uh, hegemony of uh, Germany. And I think um, it's quite new, it was uh, the last years, and it's uh, a mix between um, a correct work of made by Germany and mistakes of the rest. If we see the last 20, 25 years, we had the reunification, this was a lot of demographic power to Germany. We had um, economic success, especially with this um, export orientation uh, policy that it was you see in the figures and the numbers of uh, Germany, uh, and it's uh, great. Uh, and third, uh, and also it was really important, the political stability of the country. And at the same time, um, the Franco-Germanic like uh, motor for uh, Europe, it was not so balanced the last years the power between uh, both, and the United Kingdom was deciding to leave the last years, no? They engage in the parliament, we see uh, with the Popular Party, the Tories, and finally with Brexit. And uh, this new hegemony of Germany, I think it's uh, one kind of uh, unwilling hegemony also, because the Germans, they have uh, this uncomfortable uh, relation with the power, especially uh, in Europe. Um, I think these are the roots of, of the situation, of the geopolitical balance of power now. Um, but uh, it was explained, this, uh, this was not managed well all the time the last years, especially in the Euro crisis. Because Germany, for historical reasons, has uh, one economic framework really clear uh, with some, like, I don't know uh, how to say, um, 
historical obsessions about inflection and uh, some of these um, cultural frameworks that we have, this more ordo liberal view about the economy, you know, more, more, I don't know, uh, uh, Renanian capitalism. Um, and at the same time, we had a problem with the, with the euro. Uh, it was not um, complete, the design of the eurozone, and we didn't do enough. It was quite clear, and we are seeing the effects and the consequence of this uh, policy. But at the same time, we had the refugees crisis after, and um, uh, it was this moral approach that I think the Chancellor has of uh, the problems, and we should uh, admire uh, the answer of uh, Germany. And with Trump and with Brexit, this puts Germany with a new role. It was uh, with a new role, different than one, two, three years ago with an extra responsibility, not only uh, for leading uh, Europe, it will be uh, the role of leading uh, the liberal world, probably. I know that this is a lot of responsibility for the Germans, but it will be like it, it is. Eh? Um, especially with Trump in the White House, uh, with this new identitary movement in the uh, in, uh, United Kingdom, and with a weak position of the rest of the European partners. I mean, Uwe, let me come to you as uh, the other fellow German on this, on this panel here. I mean, we've already heard a few times now that uh, Germany might even be seen as the counter model or at least a part of the counter model to what happened with Brexit and what happened in the United States uh, with Trump. But at the same time, what always rings in my mind is what the late sociologist Ulrich Beck uh, said, that Germany created an accidental empire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, be, that was in the, in the wake of the Eurozone crisis. So how do you reconcile uh, this from a German point of view? This accidental empire, do you accept this characterization? And at the same time, you know, the expectation, and we're talking much more about expectation now, yeah, yeah. that Germany can be part of a counter model. Mm. Well, I mean, there, there's another um, uh, term that was used by The Economist, which uh, termed uh, Germany the reluctant hegemon. Yeah? So um, I think we should be modest in relation to leading the free and liberal world. No, I, I say that very honestly, we should be modest. On the other hand, uh, I would say that Germany's role has de facto changed in the EU because traditionally uh, we defended the small states and we were advocates of the small states. And since the 1990s, we are somewhat more affirmative concerning our own interests. Yeah? Uh, so I think then with what you have mentioned, Javier, a certain economic success since the 2000s, yeah, it is somewhat not intentional but accidental that we ended up today as the dominant economic power in the first place in, in, in Europe. Yeah? And, uh, uh, looking at, per, at Pervenche, at the French, uh, I think the Germans would have preferred uh, a stronger France uh, and a Britain, uh, a strong Britain, remaining in the European Union. But that's, at the moment, not the case. So, um, uh, I think uh, if you accept that you de facto have this influence in case of the Euro crisis, uh, Migration, I comment in another context. Yeah? Um, if you accept that, then as being so powerful, you have to be responsible, which means you have to be more communicative, yeah? you have to communicate with the others, yeah? you have to explain what you do. And that, in my opinion, was one of the mistakes uh, Mrs. Merkel has done in the refugee crisis. From a humanitarian and uh, a moral point of view, I also think she was correct. But she should have uh, communicated it much better. It was poorly orchestrated. Uh, and then, in the end, the attempt to make it a European uh, solution has practically failed, if we're honest. Uh, so if we take that in, as an example, I think Germany uh, has to explain its politics much better listen a lot more to the others, yeah, to mediate its own interests. One sentence on the Eurozone crisis. Um, I think uh, German politics were wrong because we were the driving force behind austerity. 
And if you look at the results after eight years, yeah, the results are poor. And they prove that this kind of structural reform approach, which namely Mr. Schäuble has promoted, has not worked. Greece has more debt today than it had when the crisis started. So I think uh, it would be good for Germany if some others would seriously push for a more expansive uh, economic policy uh, to get the Eurozone going again economically. I think Germany is partly responsible for the trouble we are in in the Eurozone. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me pick that up and let's come to uh, a point of criticism. I mean, I, I personally also agree that austerity has been nothing short of a disaster mm -hmm. and uh, has done a lot of damage. And you mentioned uh, the uh, refugee policy again. But apart from the content of the policy, can't you say that they, it created a lot of externalities by not involving European partners that necessarily were, for instance, part of the route mm. uh, that refugees had to pass through yep. in that decision. And linking that to the Eurozone crisis, has it been the case that Germany has been unresponsive to alternative models of economic policy change? So, if you ask me, I would say yes, because there was an attempt by the French president uh, together with the Italians, yeah, uh, not so much uh, supported by a conservative government in, Spain. In, in Spain, but there was an attempt uh, to push for a more expansive policy, uh, which would have not abandoned uh, budgetary discipline, but would have complemented it with investment, with a smart investment strategy. Mm -hmm. And Germany has blocked that to yeah. some extent. Yeah. Is the approach seen as uh, dictating or is it seen as being cooperative from Germany? I think somehow what uh, President Hollande has been trying to push for since he was elected uh, in June 2012, we just have to recognize uh, that uh, on the human files, he's been really pushing since the beginning that we should have the banking union on the mm. one hand mm. and an investment strategy. Mm. On the banking union, we are here halfway. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say one word because I, there's really a risk that because of the German position now on this dossier, uh, we end up with the same uh, dead end or a blockage that the one we are in, the, in the Growth and Stability Pact. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. Um, with the Growth and Stability Pact, of course, I know by heart that there are two really different vision of how you rule, what's the role of the state, what's the role of a, a state in, uh, as a driver for economic policy. On one side of the Rhine, you believe in politics, and on the other side of the Rhine, you believe in rules. It's a bit of a caricature, but it does look like this. And because of this, um, uh, uh, Lionel Jospin had accepted in 1997, when we went to the second stage of the Euro, the Growth and Stability Pact, yeah. where there are two figures, 3%, 60%. 3% inflation, uh, uh, deficit, 60% debt. Um, and they had became they, they became fixed rules and nobody could touch it. Mm. And the trust is in the rules. And the rules doesn't match reality. And now the same is coming in the banking union, where wherever there's a fixed figure, you have to go for this figure. Okay. Mm. So this is, but this is one of the reasons why I think we are now uh, blocked in this situation, is I think Germany is a very powerful country, a very big country. It has um, its own strategy, and at some stage... Um, what do you think that strategy is? Well, it's an ex export driven strategy. Uh, it's, it started with uh, uh, the Schröder's reform, mm -hmm. huh? and the Schröder reforms, sometimes people believe it was the homework by Germany following uh, 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 joining the Euro. But I think this is a fundamental mistake. Mm. I think the Schröder reform were driven by internal reason, which is the re reunification of the country. That was the first challenge, and that was the driver for so strong reforms. And this is to say that um, pff, what I think we, we lack the most is that um, when Germany is moving, how do you say it? Um, 
the main driver is going to be for internal reason, always. And each country will behave like this. Yeah. But this cannot be mm -hmm. the outcome of the best interest of the EU. Mm -hmm. And somehow we have to recreate either a Franco-German dialogue or a strong commission that allows this um, environment to, to take into account all the stakeholders, mm -hmm. where Germany obviously is going to be a critical point, but cannot be only on its own. Yes. But when it comes now to this question about uh, investment, of course now we have the, the token debate is there, huh? mm. because we have the Juncker plan. Yeah. So it's just the recognition that the EU is so stupid now to have an investment that is still below what it was uh, before the crisis. Yeah, exactly. mm. And we don't recover from this situation. When we have an aging population, uh, 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 an agenda for reform where we definitely need to enrich our people, to equip them uh, in training and, 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 and knowledge-based uh, uh, strategy. But for this, you need maybe state to have money to finance education, huh? Mm -hmm. Question mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tanya, um, we've had a, a, very few, a few very interesting points here. I mean, Pavon mentioned the rules-based approach in Germany. You might say that's a cultural approach, but if you look at it uh, differently, you can also say, if you don't trust your partners necessarily, yeah, you, you, you create you rules because rules. you take yeah. politics yeah. Yeah. effectively off the table. Yeah. You also say, uh, probably quite rightly, that the driving force is domestic, mm -hmm. and especially if you have an export-driven uh, economic model, um, mm -hmm. that is very much a domestic consideration. Yeah. And you can see that also that um, the German government has not yet accepted the uh, balance of payments difficulties that result yep. uh, from this kind of approach. So uh, what do you think? How can, how can, is this the case? Is Germany too driven by its own narrow considerations? And how could that be broken up hmm. or embedded um, in a wider approach? Driven with national interests, yes, of course. I mean, uh, what we experienced also with the Greece crisis in, in a way, um, I perfectly agree that um, these austerity measures made more damage than good and the whole Europe was suffering, not only Greece. Um, but with Germany, what, it's interesting now how the role was changing. I just recently heard one diplomat saying, you know, today you said, per once, we have to establish stronger commission. In fact, the strength of the commission nowadays is extremely weak. It's the governments that are deciding. And diplomats are saying for every single decision, you have to phone what Berlin thinks. And before you don't get the opinion from the Berlin, nothing moves on. It is annoying, one can say, yeah, but this is the reality we live in. What I fear sometimes is because France is currently weak. So if this engine that was existing and running this Europe in a way, two biggest economies, France and Germany would somehow get into the difficulties, especially with France, or maybe even with Germany, who knows what the elections will bring. But then I'm not excluding that we are at the beginning of some process that might put European Union in big difficulties. Um, especially if we face another migration crisis. But coming back to, to the mm. refugees, you were critical. I agree with you to the point that, um, how, I mean, you in Germany see it different because you were also affected with mm. a big amount of people that came, also seeing that the policies were not efficient from mm. the beginning. It was in a way of collapse most yeah, probably almost. of some yeah. norms also and values. And then these attacks that you saw around New Year mm -hmm. that were uh, really attacks and violence against the women. Mm -hmm. And this also changed the perception in Germany. Mm -hmm. But how we saw it outside, ne? of course, there was a lot of anger when Chancellor Merkel said, everyone is welcomed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people said, that's why we got so many people in Europe. This is from the beginning. But later on, Yes, Germany was dealing with other partners. We had a, my country is lying on the Western Balkan route. So most of people were coming Syria, Turkey, through the Balkans, up to Germany or Scandinavia. It was a lot of diplomacy behind to close down that route. Mm. From Germany instructed down. In fact, sometimes you wondered how much this humanitarian outside politics is still humanitarian because mm. in a way, borders were closed, instructed from Germany down to the Balkans and we pushed 
immigrants to Greece and left the problem there. And this is still the case today. In fact, Austria is still having interior border controls. Germany is also, in a way, secret diplomacy, not allowing people really inside anymore. So, yeah, there are different aspects of the, but still, it's extremely important what kind of politics Berlin is playing because um, we are lacking European way of thinking in today's European Union. We have more and more leaders that go to national borders or follow national interests and don't think with a vision what is a strategic goal for European Union. We lost that focus. We are dealing from one crisis to another crisis and not even solving one, there is already another one. And we really, as a European Union, are struggling. And that's why it's important that you have a stable, biggest economy in Europe. Mm -hmm. Of course, we small are dependent also from that. That's the reality. But that's why I think even in the future looking from German perspective, if, if there is not a strong partner, then um, I think we will feel that in all policies. Mm -hmm. um, Javi, do you, do you agree with the uh, assumption that the driver of German politics is too narrowly domestic? Well, yes, uh, I think so. I think it happens everywhere, but the effects for, um, with Germany are different because the responsibility of, G of Germany uh, is different than the rest. This is the, the, the point. No? I would want to come back to the euro, no? because we are talking about how Germany was uh, driving the eurozone the last years, who was clearly the driver. Um, well, we create the, the eurozone with four goals, no? um, basically. First of all, to have a more European identity, our citizens. Uh, second, uh, for have more and better convergence, social convergence. Mm -hmm. For to have a strong growth, uh, it was um, really clear. And at the same time, and fourth, to limit the power of Germany, because um, Germany had really, really powerful currency. No? And if we see the, the years, we failed in everything, <laughs> absolutely in everything. No, uh, it, it, it is the responsibility of Germany, or not not alone. Obviously, no, it's together. We didn't have um, enough mechanism and tools in the European framework, especially in the economic level. And at the same time, the policy it's it's a problem of institutions, and at the same time, it's a problem of policy. No, um, we were talking about austerity and why and how austerity was failing. And this is uh, clear. We need more expansive fiscal policy, especially, and we are seeing the limits of our monetary fiscal, uh, monetary uh, expansive policy. That it's really, really clear. No, It's working, but with limits. And especially uh, without um, tackle the real social problems and inequality, uh, I, will, I will underline no? uh, this problem that it's behind a lot of electoral movements that we are seeing in this uh, uh, moment. No? And uh, I will want to add something new. No? Um, well, I see uh, the lack of confidence of the rest of the po uh, European partners with Germany. This is something that is happening now. And at the same time, I see lack of confidence of Germany with the rest of the European partners. Uh, well, and we have uh, really strong gaps, no? South and North, it's really clear. It was really clear uh, in the discussions of the Eurozone, no? Creditors and debtors. And now uh, this new gap, more Eastern and Western countries, no? Uh, well, we should go together, no? And try to rebuild our confidence, uh, not based only in rules based in, in, in confidence and to rebuild this confidence in, the, in our common project, Germany has to play a leading role. Mm -hmm. Uwe, uh, as the two Germans on, on this panel, um, <laughs> we should be puzzled by one thing that, you know, there seems to be a, a broad agreement that the, the driver of uh, German politics uh, has been narrowly domestic. Of course, everybody has a certain degree uh, of, of the, yeah, yeah. But uh, maybe with a different responsibility. But you know, one of the key pillars of the German post-war settlement was that German interest equals European interest. Mm -hmm. So that is actually against what the diagnosis seems to be. And do you think that maybe there is a lack of awareness in Germany, within German politics, about their own role 
that they assume whether they like it or not. I certainly do think that. I think uh, German politicians today, I dare to say that, are more provincial than 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, it's, it's, uh, this can be explained uh, by very tough competition in elections uh, over domestic issues. So if you are a member of the German Bundestag or parliament, yeah, you can hardly win elections with Europe or with a better development policy of the European Union. You win elections with what people have in their pocket, with pensions, with migration and stuff like that. So we do have rather few parliamentarians and political leaders with a geopolitical notion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. At best, they have a perception, of course, of Europe because I would say Europe is considered in German politics today domestic policy. Yeah? Uh, but without a geopolitical vision of the role of Germany in Europe and Europe's role in the world, you end up practicing that kind of stuff what Javier has described. I think the trouble we have is that the German government, and this includes the Social Democratic Party, because we are in government, yeah, have not told German people how much we have benefited from the euro and how much we have benefited from the poor countries who pay for the debts uh, they pay for. Yeah. Up to now, Germany has not lost anything. I mean, we're running a big risk because if the whole thing blows up, we will be yeah. held accountable. Yeah? But up to now, we have only benefited from it. And our politicians should have told openly, step by step, uh, this can't be a shock therapy, but should have started to tell people that we are the big beneficiaries of the euro up to now and that we have to do something about this export-oriented economy we have. We should uh, opt more for a domestic market-driven development model which would raise uh, wages in Germany, real wages, and perhaps could include some marginalized people who are voting AfD at the moment. So I think there is really a, a problem um, with the communication of our government with our own people. Yeah? And, um, and with the substance of the policy. And, and with the substance of the policy. Yeah? It was comfortable not to talk about it. Uh, and on the contrary, German politicians, especially Schäuble, always said, we protect you Germans that these crazy Greeks don't get a hold of your wallets. Yeah? But that is not the case. Uh, I mean, the poor Greeks are partly paying for our well-being. Mm. up to now and that was never communicated and I think that might be one of the chances uh, we may have actually this is one of the frames that populists use it's us against up, them yeah. Absolutely. so that's why it's a dangerous yeah. path yeah. and that's maybe to to end this part I mean that might be one of the positive things if really Martin Schulz as a convinced European enters German politics in election time that we can start informing our people better about our role inside the European Union I think they are not aware uh, that the impact of decisions taken in Berlin is so enormous here in Brussels. Mm -hmm. They are not aware of it. Yeah. So you already started the, the outlook, <laughs> uh, which is good, Pavel, if I can come to you. Looking at 2017, obviously with elections in France as well as in Germany, how can the Franco-German engine be restarted? You know, I have a breaking news for you. For you. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> as you know, uh, we already had the... Um, uh, in France, uh, the primary election to, mm. for the right to choose their candidate. Mm. And uh, I mean, we were the socialists, we were the one to initiate this, this primary election. And obviously now it's becoming a very popular thing because the turnout was very high. Mm. And they had three very long uh, TV um, uh, debate, mm -hmm. very much follow. How how long did they dedicate it during these three debates about Europe? Well, not one minute. Mm -hmm. Not one minute. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what you're saying about the situation in Germany is unfortunately exactly the same in my country. When we know, if you take so many dossiers, 
the sustainability of our growth, mm. the welcoming of the refugees, our answer to the situation in Syria, uh, how to react after the Trump uh, victory in the US, and I can add and add and add everything if we don't have a clue of what we are going to do on these topics at the EU level. Come on, forget about it. I think one of the reasons uh, we're in such a mess, it's not only about Germany not having a, a European mindset when it takes decision on its own, it's because countries are challenged in their inequalities, mm -hmm. in their social redistribution, in the impact of globalization, and they don't they don't feel so much at ease on how to answer to this. And I think you have really um, a one-one answer between, or, or, or questioning between the national level and the EU level. The EU is not in a good shape because member states are not in a good shape and member states are not in a good shape because the EU. So where to start with, I don't know. My answer is we need to do both in parallel. And I hope next year will be an opportunity to do it. But I have one fear is that following the Brexit, I think uh, Chancellor Merkel is completely um, obsessed by one thing, not to have more division in the EU. Fair enough. So this is why she's ready to go on foreign affairs business, and I think uh, it's a very good move, it's very well welcome, even though I do understand that for the SPD it's still a debate, because here in this house, each time you discuss this, there's no money for defense, no money for foreign affairs. This is a contradiction we have to overcome. Germany cannot be the country it is now, with the responsibility it has. Trump will remind Germany about this. What? Donald Trump will remind Germany about this. Well, I don't know if they still believe NATO will, will, will yeah. secure their, yeah. their border. Yeah. And we cannot have, for example, I mean, the kind of discussion we need to have with Turkey, it, it says something about our incapacity to have a common answer to Syria. Mm. So you cannot hide yourself be, be behind these realities. But my fear is, because this would not be a dividing topic among the 27 remaining EU uh, country, Chancellor Merkel would very much like to focus on this, and she would not go to the root, which for me is the question of the sustainability of the euro as it stands. Mm. And you cannot have a euro where you have created a new tools, taking from member states some of their tools and not recreating this at the EU level. Mm. I have here currently with one very courageous CDU member, Reimer Böger, and I want to, to give his name in, in this broadcast because I really admire his courage. He is a very pro-European CDU member in this house, very experienced, and he knows if we don't move, the Euro will not survive. And because the debate now is, the situation is a mess because rules were not applied. And we say, just on a very ideologic and, and stupid base, in the end, because there's no bridge, um, the rules are not applied because they're stupid mm. and cannot be applied. And we're blocking this. But I think we need to do something about it. And for me, if we don't do something about it, if we only go for big ideas about defense, foreign affairs, we will die by the roots. Mm. So it's a serious mm -hmm. business. Yeah. I mean, Tanya, if I can come, come to you, I mean, um, I, I've heard that, well, if, if Merkel is re-elected, uh, it will certainly be her last term. And, uh, well, you never know. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> most likely, most likely be her last term. And uh, a few uh, influencing or influential voices then think she would like to leave also some sort of European legacy uh, behind. So she might be bolder, and especially in, in sort of addressing some of these issues. But, you know, from, from your point of view, what is your expectation? Uh, towards Germany or Germany's role in the EU for 2017, going into 2017, but also beyond? I think the biggest challenge also for Germany will be to keep this union together and strong. Mm -hmm. Because um, we are facing, I think we are at a very important crossroads. We already leave Europe with different speeds so, or with different concentration or blocks, put me so, different blocks of countries. And to overcome that and come back to the basic values that we establish, to come back to solidarity and to be in efficient European politics, we will need Germany to be very strong. 
Um, what was mentioned, and I see it's quite a risk that might divide countries, is what is the future of union? Because we, one way is we are strengthening the Eurozone, so very big focus on economic questions. The other, defense and security union, which are now the question of security is for me something that it's a very challenging one. And especially because Europe was always promoting fundamental rights, universal freedoms. Um, and now we are promoting security. And this is something, where is the balance? Will we manage to find the balance or we will build a fortress Europe with borders, with high technology, with high data, you know, control and so on? How far we will go as Europeans in our individual freedoms? It's a big challenge, how Europe will develop. And um, for Germany, I think it will remain an engine. It's the biggest economy. And my, of course, dream would be we don't want to have wars in European continent. It's not self-obvious that with all the nationalism and extreme rhetorics, we are not heading exactly there. I think we should always, and also in German rhetorics, you have this strong history and you have this strong awareness to remind more often on good European stories. There are many things that are good in Europe. If you look, okay, now we have Europe that is still the richest continent in the world, but the distribution of the wealth is wrong. We created very rich people, very poor in between, people are lost. We have to redistribute, we have to make this Europe really social to take care for Europeans and put people at the core of the project and when people will feel that they have safety and dignity, then I think it will be much easier to communicate also European ideas and um, policies. And for that, I still believe Germany is playing a very crucial role. Mm -hmm. uh, Javi, what, what is your expectation towards Germany, especially you know, with Brexit on the cards? Well, um, we will see the next year a lot of uh, change. You know? We will have elections on, in France and Germany, in Netherlands, and probably we will have the Article 50. Some more elections in Spain? Um, I think not. <laughs> could be. Could be. We get Maybe two. two years. Uh, yeah. next year. Two the last year, it was enough, I think. <laughs> uh, but um, we will see a lot of elections. It will be a really hot uh, year. Um, and at the same time, uh, we recognize that the rest of the world we will be with, uh, we will deal with uh, Erdogan, Putin, Theresa May, the EU, Trump. No? This is the world that we will deal, no? Uh, what I expect of Germany and of Europe, no? Because I think it's talk about the same also. Um, well, I expect that in this world with these people, with Erdogan, with Putin, with Theresa May, with Trump and with uh, the rest of the world, uh, we could be the voice of uh, the, defen the defensors of a tolerant and open societies. Democracy? The, yeah, and this is like defend the democracy, defend the the institutions, the strong institutions, defend the fundamental rights. Mm. Because the discussion will be about this in the world. And I suppose that if we don't uh, defend these ideas, nobody will defend it in inter international discussions. Nobody will defend it. Mm -hmm. and, and Uwe, mm -hmm. uh, if I can finally come um, to you, is maybe against the backdrop of the lack of awareness in Germany uh, mm. about this role, is maybe the communication of these kind of expectations uh, one of the key issues. So uh, where, where do we start in Germany to you know, start build the politics that we actually need for Germany as well as for the wider European Union? Yeah, I think in the first place we have to start at home, but I think there is very little communication between Brussels, the EU and Berlin, for example. So we should try to uh, stimulate uh, more exchange between parliamentarians. Uh, on the government uh, side, this is not the case because yeah. they meet in the council. Um, but uh, among parliamentarians, for example, and if you look at some of the more recent developments in public opinion, uh, I'm rather p uh, optimistic and not so pessimistic with what we had in, in, uh, in the debate about TTIP or CETA. We, for the first time, had a broader European public, yeah? uh, people, people sometimes maybe more aware yeah, of some issues being European than uh, the people they are governed by. Yeah. So um, I wanted to take up to, at the end of our con conversation uh, one thing you mentioned, Pervenche, and I would strongly agree, we might die from an overdose of rules-based system. 
and that is typically German because our uh, experience is that this has worked but all the other countries in Europe or most of the other countries and there are some Scandinavians that are very rules based also but many other countries were also successful at different points in time with a different system yeah? Uh, so this is a cultural thing, this is an, is an identity thing, and you can't uh, uh, change mentality of people who have had their uh, successful periods and less successful periods, as we Germans also had it after Second World War. You can't, by order, change that. So I think uh, if we look at the 2% inflation thing in the euro and the 3% budget deficit, these numbers are absolutely artificial. They are not science-based. There is no study anywhere that tells you that 2% inflation is good yeah, and 3% is bad. Or that 3% budget deficit is scientifically proven a bad thing to have and 4% is even worse and 2% is better. It's not existing. The other day we had a debate here with Stieglitz who alluded to that. He said it's totally arbitrary. Now the problem is that once we have the numbers and we have Germans in a position like this, they make the others stick to the numbers, which mm -hmm. I think in the meantime is really stupid. Yeah? So we have to break that up, we have to listen more, and I'm really afraid, I mean, what we as Germans should be interested in is a European Germany and not a German Europe. But this yeah? is where I, want, I would like to agree with you, yeah. because I pay tribute to Heimer Burger, but I would like also to pay tribute to Martin Schulz. Yeah. Because I think in all this debate, because he's been so much involved here mm -hmm. in human politics, he might be very helpful. Yeah, we I think hope he, so. he will be very helpful to put this yeah. um, mentality in the public debate uh, in the next uh, German elections. And then come back as a president of the next commission. <laughs> 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 so hopefully Martin Schulz can be a good ambassador for yeah. European <laughs> interests. Uh, in Germany when he, yeah. as, as he's now announced, uh, will enter German politics uh, in, the, in 2017. Well, I'm afraid this is all we have time for today. Thank you very much for uh, watching and for listening to us and see you next time. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>